Continuing Education knows that at the end, students want to graduate, and we can help them do that because we take the time to really listen to their needs, and we understand all the different options that are available across the campus for them. We don't take a cookie cutter approach. We realize each student comes with their own story. So whether it's a part-time student looking to complete a degree program or someone just looking for online courses, we're there to connect them to the resources of the university. Continuing education knows that at the end, students want to graduate, and we can help them do that. Your city manager. For recording purposes, today is April 10th, 2024. It is 3 p.m., and this, t this panel is number 18003, titled, Taking Up the Torch, How the Growing Power of Women is Remaking Politics. And before we get started, the University of Colorado in Boulder, Colorado's flagship university, honors and recognizes the many contributions of indigenous peoples in our state. CU Boulder acknowledges that it is located on the traditional territories and ancestral homelands of the Cheyenne, Arapaho, Ute, and many other Native American nations. Their forced removal from these territories has caused devastating and lasting impacts. While the University of Colorado Boulder can never undo or rectify the devastation wrought on indigenous peoples, we commit to improving and enhancing engagement with indigenous peoples and issues locally and globally. We will do this by recognizing and amplifying the voices of indigenous CU Boulder students, staff, and faculty in their work, educating, conducting research, supporting student <coughs> success, and integrating indigenous knowledge, Consulting, engaging, and working collaboratively with tribal nations to enhance our ability to provide access and culturally sensitive support, and to recruit, retain, and graduate Native American students in a climate that is inclusive and respectful. One other thing I'd like to mention is that we want to make sure we get a chance to ask questions. Here is how we will handle Q&A. We'll reserve the end of the discussion for that Q&A, we're using a note card system to, reserve, to receive questions from the audience. At any time in the session, simply raise your hand to request a note card and pencil from one of our producers. Producers, can you raise your hand so they know who you are behind you? Please write legibly, and if you are a student, could you please note that in your question on the card? When you finish, your hand, your, when you finish raise your hand and hand it to the producer who'll bring it to me. And I urge everyone to please make your question brief and to the point. So now, with all those preliminaries done, I'd like to do brief introduction of each of our truly, truly extraordinarily accomplished panelists. And while I'm going to be brief to allow for more discussion, I really urge you to check out their full bios on the CWA website, because it is truly extraordinary. So Morgan Kay is the CEO and founder of Motive, uh, Motive International, a Washington, D.C.-based social enterprise and women-owned small business with a mission to mitigate global conflict and instability. An entrepreneur, strategist, and former diplomat, Kay has held senior positions in the public, private, and civil society sectors, including the Department of State, Department of Defense, and U.S. Aid. And prior to her time in government, I was super fascinated to find out that she ran an NGO in Mongolia. Super, super fascinating. <laughs> Alexander Verbeck is a Dutch environmentalist, editor of the Planet Newsletter, and I hope I didn't butcher your name too much, um, public speaker and podcaster. He is a former diplomat and former strategic policy advisor at the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Over the past 30 years, he has worked on international security, humanitarian and geopolitical risk issues, and the linkage to the Earth's accelerating environmental crisis. And he has done something that is on my personal bucket list, which is do the Camino de Santiago, and I happen to catch your YouTube uh, series on that, which is also fascinating. <laughs> And Rebecca Buckwalter Polsa is an activist and, ad and advocate and provides commentary on law, politics, and policy for web and print media, radio, and television. As Alliance for Justice's senior heir and justice counsel, she is best known for her role as the first name plaintiff in Columbia University's successful First Amendment lawsuit barring President Trump from blocking journalists and other constituents on Twitter. 
And I have to say that as I was doing some research into her, I, I uh, discovered that she clerked for the late Honorable Juan Torreya, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sur First Circuit. And I'll say that as a Puerto Rican myself, he was the first Latino from Puerto Rico who served in the First Circuit. Uh, and as a lawyer as well, that is quite an honor. So little kinship there um, as I was doing the research just warmed my heart. Um, so I want to just give an opportunity for our panelists if they want to just have some opening words before we get right into questions. I just wanted to open the floor. Panelist? If not, we will dive right in. Mine is just a disclaimer that I've lost my voice. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use it. I'm going to find it for you all. <laughs> all right. We're just going to dive right into questions, shall we? Um, oh, excuse me. I have a, a city manager, right? There are emergencies that come up, and there are some of my staff that can break through the silence notifications on my phone. That happens to be one of them, so I apologize. Um, so I'm going to start with the title of our panel, which speaks to the growing power of women in remaking politics. And yet, according to a report from the Interparliamentary Union and the UN, 2023 data shows that women are underrepresented at all levels of decision-making worldwide. Women serve as heads of state and or government in only 31 countries. Women make up 26.5% of members of parliament. Globally, less than one in four cabinet members is a woman. That's 22.8%. So that's better, I'll say, than the 2023 data that shows only 10% of Fortune 500 CEOs are women which is frankly up from where it's been stagnant at 8% for many, many years. So how do we reconcile those two realities of women reshaping the world of politics and yet those, that data is staggering in terms of that underrepresentation? So maybe we'll start, uh, Rebecca, with you. Um, okay, so Rebecca Bacalter Posa, my pronouns are she, they, and ella. Um, I think one of the things that strikes me with respect to gender and politics is uh, the gap in recognition between where public opinion as a whole may be and notions of gender equality and the reality. And I think that so long as we don't make explicit and address it, um, we're not going to see better representation for women in politics, uh, at least in the United States. Elsewhere, we're doing slightly better, but um, that is my impression from my prior life as a political consultant. Um, and something that uh, I grapple with as another one of the things I do, I serve on the board of LPAC, which is the only organization in the US that exists to elect queer women. Uh, gender non-conforming and non-binary people. Um, and uh, we find it to be very necessary to be very direct about the problem and to provide solutions like training and exposure and encouragement to run for office. Um, so that's what I hope for. How about you, Alexander? I think the first question is why do we want women more in powerful roles? I mean, easy answer is it's fair enough, right? You got more or less equal men and women, so it should be represented as, as that as well. That's an easy one. Um, but there's more to it that from research, you can see that if you involve more women, you get better policies. You see it in companies where uh, women have a higher percentage of, of having leading roles in, in, in the top positions, the people on the work floor are happier and the production is uh, at a higher level and actually profits are going up, which makes it a mystery why companies that are more than, let's say, individuals or governments able to measure their success why the levels of female participation at the higher levels is still so low. If you look at governments, it's the same thing. There's only uh, 13, counting in January last year, there's only 13 countries in the world 
where the majority of government is formed by women. The Netherlands was one of them, but then our government fell, so I can't really count them at the moment. If you look at those 13 countries, which are, by the way, and that's important, they are not only Scandinavia or something. They are, you find them all across the world. It's, it's uh, Albania, there's Colombia, there's Rwanda. It's, 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 uh, it's much more diverse than you would expect. And then you look at the UN Happiness Index. Mm -hmm. These are happier countries. They're more equal, there's more social measures, there's less violence, etc. Talking about violence, my uh, life I've worked basically on two issues, on security issues, international security, human security, and I worked on environment. If you look at security, if you look at warfare, the pictures that you see is men fighting, mm -hmm. killing other men, killing often also women and children, if you see women in those pictures, they're in the role as victims. If you look at the environment, look at the CEOs of all the big companies. There's like 57 country, companies in the world that are responsible for, I believe, 80% of all the, all the pollution. All those CEOs, I dare to say without exception, but I have to check, there might be one or two exceptions. All of them are men. So men have been ruling the world now for millennia, and look where we are. We got a whole conference about what a mess it is in the world. So speaking here as a man, we don't have much to be proud of, right? So there's a good reason. Last one, I spoke about companies, I spoke about government. If you look in the families, it's the same thing. If you look in families where men and women equally share the tasks that you do in a family, which is both earning money, but also everything else that you need to do within a family, the household and whatever you can think of. The children in those families are happier, they do better at school, and actually both the men and the women are also happier. So at government level, at company level, at individual level, everyone is happier. So. That leads us to the main question of this debate. How can we improve this? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <And> <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm, I'm noticing a domination of women in the room. Um, I would like to see more men in conversations like this. Um, I'm always cognizant of that to, you know, to, not that I feel the need to sort of accommodate men, but I, I want to welcome men into conversations like this because they're they're just as big of a stakeholder, frankly. They're a beneficiary of women's participation, they're an enabler, and they're sometimes a spoiler, unfortunately. Um, I think, Alexander, you, you raise a, a, a great, and I, I hope for most of us, clear value proposition of why we should want more representation of women. To me, the more interesting conversation, perhaps, is how do we get it? And um, something that I like to just go straight to is some basic biological realities that we can't ignore, right? One of the clear, obvious reasons that you don't see more women in leadership across cultures and across time is the basic reality that they are often busy with bearing children or raising children or taking care of elderly family members, right? We have structures in our societies and structures in our biology that are, that are real that we need to discuss. Um, I, I talk to, you know, professional women that I would consider sort of the top of their class, more often than not, I would still say, don't have children. Many, it's because they've chosen to, but many, they, they couldn't find a way. They couldn't find a way to do it. Um, I'd, I'd be remiss in not pointing out that um, my child is in the room right now, one of two. <laughs> Fox, you can say hi now. <laughs> yeah. um, and so is my husband. So, you know, in our household, we, we had to think very consciously about the structures that we had to put in place to make it possible for, uh, you know, the one, one pathway is for one spouse. It could be the, the male if you're in a, you know, a, a heterosexual couple that, that forgoes a career and allows a woman, or, or it could be, you know, two female partners and one seeds to the other. Well, my husband is top in his field. He has a very demanding, serious career too. In fact, he's an army officer and an executive in a, global NGO, uh, you know, and, and we had to think very consciously though, how, how do we as a household um, make that possible? For me to be a CEO who travels 40 weeks out of the year, uh, who has 
not just one, but two small children, both under the age of six. And, and so we had to make some really conscious decisions. For us, that fortunately meant you know, leaning on grandparents, it meant having an au pair, it meant leaning on neighbors and friends shamelessly. It, and, when I, and shameless is a really important part of this because like, it is totally possible that my six-year-old is gonna scream something out inappropriate in this panel. I have to be shameless about that, right? <laughs> because to be a woman who still participates you know, in my career, I have to be real and sometimes bring my kid along. And I, and I choose sometimes to do that because I want people to confront the reality that if you want women in government or in you know, the C-suite, sometimes there's gonna be kids along for the ride. Sometimes there's gonna be elderly parents. Sometimes there's gonna be phone calls that break through and emergency calls need to be picked up more often when women, women are in those positions than when men are. So I think you know, we, we have to not get uh, shy away from those conversations about basic biology, about the realities that women do play a different role in the household, in our society, and we have to accommodate and acknowledge and make space for that in our various institutions. Things like paid family leave are a good starting place. We're the only OECD country that doesn't have mandatory paid family leave in our own government institution. When I was a diplomat, all of my female diplomat friends, when they got pregnant, they did something that really felt gross to me, but we all kind of had to do it, which was you send an email around to your colleagues and you ask them to, don't, to donate their sick leave to you so that you can take a little bit of time off with your family because the United States government does not have paid family leave. So uh, you, you, you have to use your vacation days for that or you have to take a, an unpaid sabbatical. Uh, we're the only wealthy country in the world like that and in fact, we're one of the few countries at any economic station that's like that. Um, the, the government's a really important place to start as a, as a small business owner. If that was imposed upon me as a business owner, it would destroy my business. I want to be very real about that. I wish it were true that I could uh, offer that in the private sector to women, but I can't. Our society needs to create those social safety nets at a public subsidized level as a starting place. Love that, and actually we had a question precisely about that, is how do we think childbearing still affects this inequality? So I appreciate that, and as a, as a mother who had a, her first child, or an, an only child at 42, um, that was a conscious choice about my career over wanting to have a kid, and happy about that choice, but it is a choice that women have to make um, that our male counterpoints do not. So as we're thinking about what are those other barriers? I think of things like education as well in terms of access to education. What are other barriers perhaps as you're thinking that um, impede women from, from either the early stages of getting enough education or getting on a pathway to be able to access um, some of those opportunities uh, to once you are in the position to access those opportunities to actually get to those higher levels um, because we know that there are um, some barriers in place that prevent women from achieving some of those higher positions. And I'll open that to anyone who wants to answer. I actually think it's much more than that. So yes, there is uh, the childcare and all those aspects and you can do more in, in government. I think there's a, a lot of other structures that have nothing to do with this without denying that, that this is part of it. I think if you have a boardroom of older gray men smoking cigars and then somebody says, well, we have here this talented young woman who's a high flyer and could be the next CEO, I think the first reaction in a lot of those boardrooms is let's make sure that this doesn't happen, you know, because she might be better than we are and then the whole game is over. So I think there's a lot of, of structures that are in there that are not not mentioned, not outspoken, but they are assumed that way and that is and I very much agree with what you just said that government has to break it open when I started as a diplomat I recently saw the annual photograph of the annual ambassadors conference when all the ambassadors of the world come together which is like ambassadors consul generals like 150 men on a black and white picture from 1992, there was one woman who was sitting in the middle, they were kind of proud, like we got this one female ambassador. With a lot of push from the government and parliament asking numbers every year, we have now managed to raise it to 
female ambassadors, which is in what I would say the 60, 40 brackets, one way or the other way, but let, that is, let's say, it was in the 50% range. I wouldn't mind at all if it would be the other, the other way around. But that, is, that was only possible. It was a big push from government. Did our diplomacy fail? Did the whole thing collapse now that so many men are out? No, actually, I think we do a lot better. But you need, you need a lot of push for, yes, regulations on childcare, et cetera, but you also need another change in mentality. I think it should start at schools. I think it should start with families at home. I think it should start in law. And you need an approach from all sides to make such a change in society. You know, it's funny that ties into another question we got from the audience about how can women expect to be equal participants in society and government when men hold the power and are legislating control over women's bodies? And I think that speaks a little bit to the structures questions that you were referring to, Alexander. So for Morgan and Rebecca, maybe those are questions to, to think about <clears throat> if you have a response to that. For me, it brings to mind, again, the need to make explicit the deficit of representation of women. And it's great that you look at a photo and you say, oh, that's way too many men. But how many men look at a photo that's mostly men and say, oh, that's, that's odd. Look how many men are in that photo. Or how many women look at that photo and have that reaction, for example. It's uh, something that's internalized and endemic and uh, absolutely should be part of public education, should be part of uh, social policy, which we don't do a great job with in the United States, but you know, I'm, I'm also a bit of a radical in some ways where I'm like quotas. I mean, everyone should be automatically registered to vote. We should have quotas for uh, elections and for representation in bodies where that's a possibility. Um, and, I think one of the things in, is local office um, is a great place to start. Um, but we have to make it abnormal, or at least have people recognize that it should be abnormal to see any body that's supposed to be a representative of a profession, of an area, anywhere, and it's all white faces or all men or you know, faces we presume to be white or male, um, and to, to be thoughtful about these things. It's funny, you, you mentioned the word quota, and, and maybe I'll throw it to Morgan for this one. Um, I believe India just last year passed a law where they reserved one third of their seats of, I think it's lower parliament to have for women. Um, and that has been a controversial conversation, right? To have quotas for women, um, and there have been conversations about for other race, ethnicities, our LGBTQ constituents, right? There, uh, it's, it's a thought that is advancing and curious about what your thoughts are on whether or not quotas uh, are the way to go. Um, Maureen? I'm, <clears throat> I'm, I'm of two minds on this, and, and maybe this is shared by, by folks. I think, to me, th there is a clear case to be made for quotas. It's, it's sad that we have to institute something like that because I think we'd all like to believe that, say in an elected body, people of their own free will and volition would elect a representative body. We know from history and from the present moment that that doesn't tend to be the case. Um, I think you know the, the, uh, some of the skeptics of systems like quotas would say that um, you know, you, you, Quotas enable people to cut the line, you know, to skip the line because you're pulling from a, a smaller pool, and you know you're saying, if if everyone, you know, had to work this hard to get up to a place where they could be chosen, elected, promoted, selected, you know, and now you're just instituting a, a you know, a, a minimum, people are going to get pulled up from the bottom. Um, it, to me, it's it's sort of like, so what, you know, like, you know, if if that's what you need to do. You know, to pull people up, and even in, in the in the argumentation against it, saying pull them up from the bottom, so you recognize they're at the bottom. <laughs> it, it, it's like I, 
uh, I, I work a lot with, with the military and, and one uh, particular moment of sort of fraughtness was um, you know, in, in our recent past when the limitations of women in, in all in combat arms and military was lifted and women were allowed to go for any career field in the military, um, including in, in special forces and the rangers and you know, there's, there's nothing now that's only reserved to the purview of men. There was a very fraught debate about you know, what this would do and would you have to lower the standards. And actually, if you ask most men in the military, they're like, if, if you had to you know, even lower the standards just by a, a, a hair, you're gonna benefit so much by pulling women in because in the reality and the complexity of a military operation, we're gonna derive so much more benefit from women's presence that the tiny marginal you know, amount we might surrender in sort of a physical standard is worth it. And so you know, there was a recognition that women were, you know, are disadvantaged and shackled, whether that's physically, politically, structurally, culturally, and that there needed to be some sort of like accommodation and allowance because the, the value and the benefit was worth it. So in that sense, I'd say like the, you know, the idea of a quota fraught, less than ideal, but worth it. Do you want to speak to this? Uh, no. I, 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 no, I so no, much I agree you, with everything I hear. Yeah. So, yeah. I thought you were uh, wanting to, and and it's interesting as we think about that, right? Because there are there are uh, again uh, different perspectives. If you think about the notion of a quota, uh, about how do we lift people up, and I uh, again uh, thinking about a question in the audience. If you've got good questions today, thinking about how does that, and I'm gonna add a little bit to the question, so forgive me, audience members, about the psyche, right? And, and the question is, how do we heal the psyche of women to lean in um, when we have societies that tell us we shouldn't? And I add to that when we're thinking of pulling people up, there is this notion of, am I token, am I enough, if I have, on top of not feeling like I should lean in, but now I'm feeling like I have been brought in and I, have, I don't deserve it. So there's that sense of, um, do I really belong here and how do we combat that? And so uh, that is something that both we feel without quota and how would that, how is that gonna feel as if we add that element to the equation? I'll send it to the panel. Uh, I don't think a quota could do much more over and above what we already do to women to feel like imposters or inadequate uh, and out of place. Um, I do highly recommend suing the sitting president of the United States to teach you that you belong exactly where you are and stepping up is well within your power. Um, but that was for all the privileges that I have and I recognize those and I think that's an important piece too, because we want all women, not just women who are privileged, uh, to be able to step forward, to be able to step up. Um, it, it still took something kind of extraordinary to make me make that leap um, and to feel like I was doing something meaningful and had something to contribute. Um, and. Uh, I think about meaningful uh, strides in visibility um, for women and, and for folks who don't belong to the gender binary as well. Um, both parts being very important. I think you, for centuries, have had a quotum mm -hmm. which said something like 100% of everything that's relevant should be in the hands of men. Um, if you feel that that is not the right quotum, better change the quotum and say something like, let's do it 50-50. That will lead to a reaction amongst men. So like, hey, well, now we don't have a fair chance anymore. You know, it used to be, it used to be so good in our society. Huh? America was good, let's make it good again, huh? <laughs> Great. And that is, one of the things that puzzles me in America, I'm, I'm European, which you can hear my Dutch accent. What puzzles me in America is that after more than 200 years of, of, of United States history, you finally had a chance in 2016 to choose between a woman and a man. There was just not any woman or any man. This was a highly talented woman with a lot of relevant experience. 
Yet 52% of the white women who had a chance for the first time to vote for a white woman voted for a guy who's accused by dozens of white women, and well, I don't want to keep it so much in the color, but that seems to be a thing in America, for either being raped or assaulted or whatever by this very guy. The majority voted for this guy, who then, when in office, kept behaving as he was behaving. He didn't tone down, and he hasn't since. He might come back. I won't mention any, won't mention any names here. Um, but it might get much worse. So the stakes are much higher. So if you want positive change in this society, you have to use any means you have to actually to grab it because the other side of the spectrum is not lenient or flexible at all. You will actually get a reaction back. Just today, the Supreme Court of the state of Arizona found a law for 160 years old which nearly completely bans abortion. So this is man making America great again, as great as it was 160 years ago, but taking away the rights of women. That is the situation that you're in. So you, ha you, have, to, you have to fight it because the, 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 the tendency in society along, uh, among a large part of society is going exactly the wrong way. And that is not good for women, but it's not good for society either. So you have to fight for your rights and yeah, get men on board because then you're stronger. I mean, there's, there are some reasonable men I heard. Thanks. <laughs> I mean, <clears throat> this, is, this is a funny stance to take. I, I, I am a friend of women. I, I, I've, it's taken me a lot of years to maybe embrace the term feminist, but now I, I, I own it, I use it. I certainly wouldn't be bothered if someone labeled me that. Um, I, I, I recognize that I am maybe rare in, among women in that I have never felt like an imposter. I never felt held back. I always felt like I deserve to belong. Now that may be because I just have a really big ego. Um, and, but, but I also think that, and, and there, like you talked about psyche, which I think is really important. I, I have conscious memories of being a five-year-old, a four-year-old, where I just had this innate sort of sense of like, I'm the boss of me. It wasn't in a rebellious way, but something kind of remarkable happened, which is my parents, a mother and a father, made space for that, and including my father, who's like the most sort of like heteronormative, waspy, you know, like rich white American male you get. Like he fits every sort of stereotype, but he 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 was totally unfazed. More than that, he would have looked at a picture and been like, that's a lot of men. You know, and he had one daughter and one son. And he, without consciously thinking about it, he was just like, you're both smart and capable and privileged. So just like do big, important stuff. And I really don't think that he was like trying to be consciously sort of progressive in his ideals. It was this very just sort of like, ah, here's a person. And he kind of like respected this brazenness in me as a five-year-old to just be like, I belong. I'm just as worthy. I've got things to say just as much as my brother. And he, there was never, I never felt any sort of pressure to sort of stifle that or put a lid on it. I married someone who's also like that, you know, who does look around. He's also an army officer and often looks around and is like, a lot of men, we gotta change this. Most of his bosses have been women, incidentally, in the military. Um, you know, but like there, there are a lot of men out there, a lot. Like let's let's give them the credit. Who are like, hey, I know I've been part of the problem because I haven't been vocal enough about this, but like I'm for this. I am for women being at the table. I am not scared of this. I want this. Like let's get them to amplify their voices. There's plenty of them. Let's just turn it up. So as we think about turning up that volume, as, as you sit here and you look at the nation, as you look at the world, how is that power showing up? How are you seeing that shift and you're seeing women truly remaking politics? What are some examples of that that are inspiring? Jacinda Ahern, well, she's, she's stepped down now, but what she did in New Zealand, I think was amazing. It, I, whenever I saw her with her 
charisma and consistently taking the right decisions. Um, that's an inspiring example, but also, I mean, New Zealand is a bit, you know, like the kind of obvious ones. You know, I mentioned Scandinavia, it's a bit in that corner, but take a country like Bangladesh that has the longest sitting female prime minister in a Muslim country. So it's not as, as obvious in those few countries where, where you think you, you would find it. But yeah, I think she's inspiring and a bit out of politics, uh, Greta Thunberg. Um, so I mentioned the bad role of men in climate. Uh, look at Greta, what she achieved. She was just 16 years old and, 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 uh, and created a worldwide mass movement to do the right thing. Or another example of today, um, a group of elder women, elder defined as 60, uh, 40, no, 60, <laughs> 46 years, 64. <laughs> Mixing, my, mixing up my Dutch and English, we just keep, uh, keep mixing the, those, um, those, um, those numbers up. Um, but 64 was the youngest woman. Uh, the, older, the older women were all older. In Switzerland, they went to the European, uh, uh, European Court for Human Rights, and they said the Swiss government uh, is not doing enough to stop climate change and that will impact our health because older people are more sensitive to heat. Um, and they won the case. So the government is, of Switzerland is now ordered by the Euro European Court of Human Rights to do more about climate change. That happened today. That is also power that you can use. Use the legal means that you have to make progress. And that's, that's another great example. Yeah. Who's inspiring you all? I mean, you know, the, the title of this panel is, you know, women remaking politics. I don't, I don't frankly think that's happening yet. Not, not at, I mean, it's, it, there, are, there are incidental token cases. Yeah, Jacinda Ardern, awesome, so cool. Like in, in our country, there are a few, you know, individual examples, but I, I, don't, I don't think women en masse have sort of like coalesced to really have something that's bigger than a, in a few key individuals. Um, like, you know, I'm trained as a biologist, so we talk about like charismatic megafauna, you know, or like the sexy way that you raise money for biodiversity, because you can't raise money around like ants, you know, <laughs> so you can raise money for tigers and whales. Like, there's a lot of like charismatic, like megafauna women, um, but like, I, there's not enough like ants, you know, like wh where, where is like the whole ecosystem of women coming together to like at a really systemic level? And, and I think, you know, we, if you're not in politics, if you're not in government, you see elected officials, you see people on the news, but governments are run by mostly sort of silent bureaucrats, you know, who are just like in the organs and in the halls of government. And those places, having served in them across three agencies in our government, are just absolutely still so male dominated. And I don't mean just there's more men, that is true, but the, the processes, the systems, the workflow, the, the language, the, you know, the power structures, they're very male still. And so women still have to conform to those male systems. And there are strong women in there, but they're still sort of playing a male game. And you don't see a lot of sort of like, that sort of mid-level or even sort of like junior level coalescing of women to actually change systems. You know, to change how, you know, for example, you know, something as benign or sort of seeming insignificant as, meeting dynamics, you know, how is, how, is a, how is a room set up for a meeting? Is it sort of like head of table and minions? Because if it's head of table, chances are it's going to be a man because chances are the power structures still in place are, are dominated by men. Or is it round? Is it circle? You know, is, is there discussion? Is, is, you know, dissent favored? Is, 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 is a you know, collective decision or outcome on a certain time pace allowed for. These are sort of inherently systems that have been defined and that we've all accepted that tend to be a little bit more conducive to the male brain. Um, and so I don't, I don't see the sort of remaking of political organs and systems into something that is like inherently female or gender neutral. I don't see it. I'd love to answer the part about who's inspiring me. Okay. Um, I'll give you one example from Colorado, Leslie Harrod. Yeah. 
a black queer woman uh, elected to office here and made her way and despite threats of violence. At times she needed protection just going through her daily life. Um, Stacey Abrams, Kamala Harris. I have been so deeply disappointed by how sexist this country's response to our first female vice president has been. I think she gets too little credit on a regular basis. I hear criticisms that take me right back to 2016. Um, and it's very disappointing. And it's one of the things that frustrates and concerns me because here's this major stride. We should be having a golden moment. We have a black South Asian woman vice president, a woman who chose not to have children, who made her career on her own, who has this remarkable partnership, all these things that we should want to see and really treasure, and she's not getting the credit that's due. And that's familiar, right? Um, I think of Senator Tammy Baldwin, who's simply been being herself and doing the work for so long. She's a candidate we were honored to be among the first to endorse and work for, and having the privilege to speak with her and hear from the very few gay women who are in federal office, uh, Angie Craig, Sharice Davids. Um, it's just, these women are incredibly inspiring, but it's also so frustrating to see how hard they have to work. You know, in heels, backward, uphill, all the cliches, um, but they are inspiring and that is something that I hold close and I hope that we can all continue to think about. There are some in our country that may say um, leaders like Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez or Ilhan Omar are bringing grassroots activism to a different level of leadership in the nation and changing the way um, politics and political activism is happening in the United States. On the other side of the spectrum, one would say, or one could argue that Marjorie Taylor Greene is bringing a different kind of activism um, to the Republican Party. And both of those are shaping how uh, American politics is happening um, for different, uh, in, in different perspectives, right? But they are women who are reshaping politics in very different ways. Um, how do you think that is, um, that kind of leadership is um, reshaping the way this nation is moving? I mean, when you, when you bring 50% of your, 51% of your population, you know, to the stage, they're gonna have a range of views and ideas. So, you know, I, it, to, to be a champion of women, you, you have to be a champion or at least a, a, a tolerant you know, voice for all women, even ones you don't agree with. So, you know, I, I, there's probably a camp that's like, ah, people like Marjorie Taylor Greene, you know, she's, she's been like, she's just a, a stooge of the patriarchy, you know, she needs to come and spend more time with us women. Well, no, you know, don't, don't, don't deny her, her womanness. You can debate and deny, you know, the, the validity of her ideas <laughs> till the day is long. But, but if you, you, know, if, if you want to really empower 51% of your population, you have to be prepared to make space for all of it. I think it's uh, somebody like uh, Alexander Tasio cortez is inspiring to the youth um, because she's so young and so talented and so well-spoken. Mm -hmm. And starting from a you know, relatively humble background, I remember the pictures where she's just working in a cafe or a bar, uh, while building up this, this political career. Um, so I hope she inspires young girls to be active, just like um, Taylor Swift, who's calling out for people to vote. She doesn't say at which party, but I think she called once and the next day 36,000 uh, women registered to vote. I'm pretty sure many of them for the right party. So that is, that is an... <laughs> Which is not the one on the right, well anyway. Okay, I'm not a native speaker. Numbers, right, left, conservative. But uh, yeah, so it's, it's I, I think young women playing this role, they can, they can be so 
motivating. I, I want to say one other thing. Um, I noticed something else uh, yesterday after this uh, funny and, and, and captivating uh, keynote speech. We could ask questions. Dozens of people lined up. There were like 15, 20 questions. Has anybody noticed something special about the people who asked the questions in a room where the majority was women? Yeah. Not a single woman asked the question. And this is a progressive society where here in Boulder where I don't think that people, feel, uh, women feel that they, they cannot stand up to ask a question. Not a single one asked a question. Why is that? What is, what is behind it? You will not be threatened, you will not, there will not be violence if you speak out as a, it's a safe place. What is it that triggers men to do this and women not to do? I mean, just... I agree. I think it was, that's an incredible observation. But, but sort of to the point I was making, what if the idea of standing up to ask a question is sort of an inherently male forum and structure and idea where, you know, it's just a question. You know, I'm, I, I'm often the one who stands up and, and asks the question. That's a setting I'm comfortable in. But I know that a lot of women aren't, you know, and, and, and that's their truth and that's their reality. Maybe they're still processing what they're hearing and they want to have a conversation, you know, later. Maybe they don't want to sort of dominate with a view, you know, they're, so, so the idea that, come on women, do this thing, participate in this system that may inherently have sort of a, an unconscious male slant to it. Yeah. So maybe, you know, I think it, it was very thoughtful whoever came up with the idea of stand up and ask questions or write the question on a card, because that's just not men, women, that's extrovert, introvert, non-native English speaker, non-native English speaker, that was a really good sort of innovation to accommodate, I think. I think women are also often keenly aware of how innately vulnerable they are in a society that does not treat equally and value equally men and women and recognize how precarious uh, something like status can be and are less likely to step up and risk that for a question. Um, I feel like, I, I, I do feel like sometimes I budget my energy or I pick which battles to fight. That was one of my first lessons. Started working in politics at 19 and it remains one of the best things is you gotta know which rabbits to chase. Um, and I think that women are under so much more pressure and know how difficult it is. Could be the format, could be anything, but it's, you know, allotting my energy. Um, I wanted to say too, I think one thing that's been important, not elected office, but women in law. And um, it's strange to, to recognize, I recently learned that only 2% of lawyers in the United States are Latinas. I'm one of that 2%. We, we are part of that 2%. Recovering. <laughs> Guilty. Um, but it's a good lesson for politics because having women on the bench makes a difference. Having gay people, having LGBTQ people on the bench makes a difference. Having people who belong to racial and ethnic minorities, other Latinos like Judge Toruella, um, on the bench makes a difference. We bring different perspectives. We yield different results. So and true. I was going to say our, our trio on the Supreme Court who are doing a very difficult job. Um, and again, not enough credit given. Um, when you're not in the majority, you make concessions to try and narrow the scope of the decision that you're going to get. And it's a very hard line they're walking uh, very publicly. Um, and so my last inspiring woman, Sonia Sotomayor, Indeed, indeed. Oh, thank you. Questions continue to come in. Um, and I, I want to go back. We, we started a little bit with um, the difference and the disparity with women that are heads of state and government. And frankly, a lot of the places and where they are heads of state and government is in Europe. And uh, I hearken a little bit to um, something you brought up, Morgan, in terms of those safety nets. And we had a little bit of a question here on how to create more safety nets. And 
Undoubtedly, I think that Europe has some of those in other countries which allow, I think it's, it goes back to the structures question. If you had better structures in place, I think there is more space for um, mobility and um, where people don't have to make those choices, where women don't have to make those, uh, those choices. How do we uh, fight to have more of those safety nets um, place so that we don't have to fight those barriers, um, particularly here in the United States, because what I think about when I was hearing the inspiration, I am inspired by many people in the United States. I don't know that I would say that they are transforming politics, whereas I do think that people in Europe and other places are truly transforming the world on a global scale because they have that platform in ways that I don't know that women here have yet to do. Um, so I'm curious about those, those reflections. Well, you're looking at me as the European here. Um, yeah, a few thoughts. First of all, um, although we have relatively more female ministers or leaders of government, etc., in Europe, for none of them it's easy. It's, there's a lot of hatred coming for men, from men directed at them in all kinds of way, in social media, etc. And I'm not proposing to do it the other way around, to start harassing those men. They would not create a better society, but it's amazing that it doesn't happen to men. But whenever a woman rises up to a higher position, we've had the same in the Netherlands, which is a relatively progressive country in many ways. The hatred our vice um, prime minister received is incredible. It made her stop her work because of all the threats. She was so worried for her children that she chose another job. And that's a, that's a disaster that that is possible even in a, a, a modern progressive society as the Netherlands. Same happened in, in Finland with this, uh, this, this government where there were so many young women uh, in, in government. So there's a lot of um, these stories. Uh, on the plus side, yeah, there's a lot of things you can learn from Europe. I think that is the secret why <laughs> I'm often asked back here, because there's so many good stories of what we do in Europe. I lived in Sweden for five years until, um, until four years ago. In Sweden, there was an active feminist policy in, across the board everywhere that went as far, for instance, that um, just to, for me, a rather extreme example or something that I had never thought about, uh, when they do crash tests with cars. Mm -hmm. It turned out that the puppets they put in there had for decades always been male. They're built differently. The weight is at different places. So they were testing if the cars were safe for male to crash against the wall, but they never tested on women. So, and there are differences. So it's across the board, they try to, and that reminds me of what you were just talking about, structures in like meetings, etc. Since there's a way we do meetings, because we developed that over hundreds of years, but there were just these cigar smoking men of the past, right? And now we do it differently at the times of today, how you organize, etc. So there is um, no country in the world where this process has been finalized and that we're there and that there's like 50-50% equality. For each and every country, there's still still a lot to do. But it's good to look at each other and see what, what we can learn from other countries. And some countries are better in one field than, than in the other. Take parental leave as one more example, and then I'll stop. In the Netherlands, when uh, our daughter was born, my wife had like pregnancy leave in, in, in the last six weeks and then another two and a half months. So I think altogether it was like four months. I got two days. One day to be there at the delivery itself, if she managed to do it in 24 hours, <laughs> by law. And the only other one is that because the child has to be registered within three days, they said, okay, the guy can do it because the woman is probably busy. So I legally had two days off. Whereas at that moment already in nearby Norway, they already had laws, or they came soon after, that the... I'm not sure if that's the right word in English, the, the parental leave, so not the pregnancy leave, but the parental leave, that that is, I'm not sure if it's 100% equal between men and women, but at least it means that men for several months are not expected to show up at work, not only in government functions, but also 
and companies, which early on establish a pattern within the family that the man also is carrying out responsible tasks for taking care of the children. And you know what? A lot of them find like, hey, this is nice, you know, my father never did this. I have time with my child, to, to bond with my child, it's fantastic. And they do it a bit differently, they're called, they're, they're called the latte daddies, yeah, the, the latte kind of cappuccino, you know? <laughs> so you see them in Sweden where I live, you see, especially on the Fridays, you see these young guys walking like, like they're proudly in a Porsche or something. They walk with their, their prams and they go and drink latte. And, but they love it. And everybody gets better out of it. The women don't lose years in their careers. The men lose a little bit by not showing up, but everybody accepts it because it's the society. So yes, there's a lot to learn. One last thought, for policies like that, you need more governments and not less. So that might be relevant in this country. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, it's structure, I, I love that example. Yeah, that, that who, who you might think on the surface that paternity leave is sort of, you know, part of the patriarchy when in fact it's, it's a feminist policy because precisely you're, you're engaging and, you know, holding accountable men to carry the load in, in the home. Um, I, really, really great example. Thank you. I, I think as much as structures though, and maybe more important than structures are norms that have to shift. One that came to mind when I was thinking about this panel is still in our society, it is, it is within the realm of, of norms, whether in business or politics, for men to help other men. You know, the proverbial sort of like the country club networking, the, the locker room talk, the hey, I know a guy, let me introduce you. Women do not do this for each other. And it's so irksome to me that like, I don't feel that women should do it as a sort of moral code with other women. Women should do it for people. People should do it for people. And there's, you'll, you'll know, my husband will know the example I'm talking about, a good friend of ours, a woman. She and I were in sort of adjacent industries and, and we, you know, over a, at a dinner party, we realized that there was a very, very clear mutual business opportunity where if we had sort of collaborated and if she had called her boss to say, hey, let me connect you to this friend and neighbor of mine and introduce you, but she was unwilling to do it because if a woman sort of says, oh, this is just my neighbor and friend, you know, our kids play together, but I'm introducing her to my, to my superior into my professional setting, then it would be seen as illegitimate. Whereas men, this is my friend from, from basketball, this is my friend from golf, it's my tennis buddy, and I'm introducing him to this business deal. It's totally normalized. But women, when we sort of cross the personal into professional realm, it's seen as unprofessional. And that norm has to stop. Women and men, both need to be comfortable helping each other and breaking those barriers between personal and professional when they are perfectly appropriate. That's so funny. Uh, uh, that is so true and accurate, and it goes against what the studies have said of how women lead. Um, I, I think I was mentioning to you before we came in here, there was a great um, study by, um, uh, the Westminster Foundation for Democracy in partnership with the Global Institute for Women's Leadership in King's College, London. They reviewed over 500 articles, publications, evidence-based institutional reports. And what they came to their conclusion as they looked at that was, uh, quite frankly, their summary was, when women take part in politics, the whole of society benefits. Basically, women policymakers prioritize issues that benefit the most vulnerable in society, such as healthcare, welfare, and education, so they're more likely to make equal and caring societies. They're more likely to focus on the issues because they have greater experience of deprivation and because they're often responsible for caring for others. They often work harder than men to represent their constituencies, which is linked to a stronger sense amongst voters that government is responsive to their needs. They have increased representation of women in elective offices in associated with counteracting corruption and focusing resources on the quality and consistency of public service delivery. So all these amazing benefits of women leadership, and yet we hold ourselves back from supporting women leadership um, and often find, thank you, and often find um, that perhaps we have this 
norm in our head that we are judgy of other women leaders. So we do all this for society, and yet amongst ourselves, um, there is something that holds ourselves back from supporting other women leaders. What is that all about? I think it's, you know, society, men and women, viewing it as like, you're just helping her because she's a woman. You know, it, I think women are reluctant to refer another woman for a job. You know, I, as, an, as an employer, I get a lot of applicants who work for me. Female applicants tend not to name people that if they had named, like, you know, I know this person you know, call them for a reference. They want to sort of, they think that might be inappropriate if they are, you know, getting, getting a helping hand, whereas men, men are like shameless about it, right? You know, I know this advisor, I know this person you know, or I'll get the call from the advisor nominating a, a man for that job. I'm perfectly fine with that. I'd frankly like to see more people nominating women and helping women in that way, and, not, and, and women not being afraid to sort of like, also, Take the help. Take the help. It doesn't, it doesn't diminish your value. It does not. Whatever will get you in that position of power, take it. Men have been taking it. Take it. I'd add one thought, um, which is a scarcity mindset and the sense that there's only room for one. Um, and I am, a, as a friend would say, multiply oppressed in the sense of being Latina lesbian, female, and in each of these communities, and especially where they intersect, there is very much an awareness of that I think is hopefully there's less need for, but there was certainly a time when it was a very real consciousness, and recent Supreme Court rulings on affirmative action remind us that that time has not ended, um, but the sense that there can only be one, there's room for one, we're competition. Uh, I believe Madeline Albright was the one who said, uh, if you think that women are gonna help other women, you never went to high school, something to that effect, <laughs> um, which is damnably true. Another woman who is super inspiring. Um, I, I wonder if there are particular areas as you look back again to the, to the way in which w women are remaking politics, are there areas or industries that we are lacking that we're not seeing that happen? And I guess what comes to mind is, and I think of it in particularly diplomacy, are we seeing enough women in those diplomatic roles? Because that is an area that I think in particular uh, women are particularly good at and, and wonder if, if, if that or other areas, um, we need to be seeing more women in those roles. Two former diplomats yeah. at the table, so I guess those are for us. I mean, um, I, there are a lot of really, really strong, yeah, Madeleine Albright, notwithstanding, uh, female diplomats that have really made history. Um, th there are some, if, if we ask the general public to sort of name American diplomats, I'd say a pretty decent share, I think, would be women. Uh, a lot of the, the senior most diplomats in our administration right now are women, a lot of ambassadors are women. Um, but. But again, I get back to sort of like, they're often playing in a man's world and in a man's game. Um, there, there's absolutely a thought process. I, I, I have not been a president of the United States, but I bet that every president, before they name an ambassador to a country, is thinking about, if I pick a woman for this country, how will, how will she be perceived? And, so, and it's not like, well, as a second class citizen, it's yes, and I'm gonna intentionally Choose it in spite of that. You know, I'm going to choose a female ambassador for Saudi Arabia, as Saudi Arabia chose a female ambassador to the U.S. Currently, very, very, very conscious choice. Um, so, I I think that women in diplomacy are have a sort of remarkably further along pathway in this space. But I'd like to see the rest of the sort of systems be there to, you know, a, a, I don't know take instead of just the, the senior most leadership position, but make the institutions, not just the diplomats making the, the high profile deals, but the, the whole foreign policy machinery, which is where the real decisions about whether or where and when to go to war are made. It's in the machinery. By the time it's gotten to sort of the headline diplomat, it's probably too late. It's in those silent bureaucratic processes and those systems are still overwhelmingly male. Yeah, I, I agree. 
Ambassadors are very visible. Yes, it's an important job. It's, it's highly respected, etc. The true decision making is made in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, but on the other hand, normally there is a kind of exchange that you are an ambassador for a number of years, and then if you do that on a high position, you also come back in a higher position in the ministry. But should we look at diplomacy? Well, yes, of course. Diplomacy as a former diplomat, I believe it's really important. But we also have to look at all those other roles. I mean, in a country like America, where since you have Citizens United, basically the policies are made by companies instead of people, which I think is something your country should change. Um, it is highly important that you have more women in leading roles in the companies because the companies are so very, very important here. And that is much more difficult to achieve because as government, you can, you can, you can set standards, etc. It's going to be awfully difficult to set a, a kind of quotum for a company, which I, I don't think you should go that way, but you should stimulate it in, in, in other ways. Um, because that is so important. So we have, we have to look further than just, let's say, the most visible civil servants that we have. Look at all the, the whole legal side. I wonder, now that AI is slowly being introduced in the legal system, I wonder what an, a kind of AI robot would do if you put two cases, you present two cases of some misdeed, what has been done, and one is a man and one is a woman, how this AI computer judge uh, would, would react to, to what is proposed. So we need, we need more equality and more fairness in the judicial system as well and everywhere in society. Beck, in our last few minutes, I'll give you the last word on areas in which you think there has to be more representation of women. Uh, I suspect maybe the law may be one of them. <laughs> Boy, yes. Um, I'd love to see more women teaching law. I'd love to see more women on the bench. Um, I, I'll take a moment, and this is the work that I do, but uh, the Biden administration having appointed uh, at least 36, it may be higher by now, black women to the federal bench, um, including several to districts that had never before had a judge of color of either gender. Um, so law is, is definitely one of those places. Um, and there are, I sort of aired before when I said judges are not elected, because of course many are uh, at the state level. And I'd love to see more women in all of these places. Um, and in scholarship, in writing, in, um, and my example is so I was, um, I had a partner who had a very gender neutral name and the difference in how editors responded to each of us was pronounced based on their perception. They would write back, Mr. Sepp. And she had better luck. She may also have been a better writer. But the gendered aspect was so apparent. And I think that things as small as that is just the byline. Let me normalize that my news source my anchor is a woman, the person that I'm trusting, the person I'm watching, the person I'm listening to, the person I'm reading. Um, you know, I, I think about things like gender neutral names. I'd love to not have to think about that and not have it be the default. And I think that a step forward is uh, seeing women represented in image, in uh, name, and in all manners uh, through more forms of media as well as in the law. As one of the 29% of city managers that are around the nation, I will say that more representation in government is also something. But I thank you all for your questions and your participation. I apologize that I did not get to whether or not you thought the Barbie movie had a positive impact for women, because I think that would have been a really great answer. But for now, a big round of applause to our panelists. <laughs>